The last few weeks has seen an influx in new high-end PC hardware, but what if you're looking to build a great system that can fly through all the latest titles at 1080p high and want to spend around about $800? Well, in today's video, I'll be showing you how to do just that with a build that punches well above its weight for an affordable price point and that's going to be fairly easy to put together. Let's do this. <laughs> I usually start my builds off by talking through the CPU and GPU combo, but first I want to talk about the GPU on its own. Now my number one pick for this build and this price point would be the Intel Arc B580. However, there are a couple of other options that I want to talk through and explain why it was I picked the Arc B580 over something like the RTX 4060 or 7600 from AMD. Now the Arc B580 launched to rave reviews and almost similarly to the new RTX 5090 and 5080, when it first launched you couldn't buy one. Pricing and availability is still a little rocky and while I have seen people get them at MSRP from places like Micro Center, you do need to be careful with how much you spend on this card. The Arc B580 comes packed with plenty of video memory, in fact probably slightly more VRAM than you're actually going to need, great 1080p gaming performance and Intel's XCSS is actually on par if not slightly better than AMD's FSR when it comes to AI based upscaling. Now this is the limited edition version from Intel but any B580 you can can get is going to give you pretty much the same performance, so go for the one that's best as far as price is concerned. Now the other options for Nvidia and AMD would be the GeForce RTX 4060. This particular card has 8GB of video memory, which is something I heavily criticised when the card first landed, and while it does have good 1080p performance across the board, I just don't really like it as a proposition. I think it's too expensive, doesn't have enough VRAM, and is outperformed, generally speaking, by the B580. The other option would be AMD's card, the RX 7600. Unlike the the Nvidia GPU it costs a little less so I think the price is better but you still have the same VRAM issues and AMD's FSR and ray tracing is inferior to both Intel and Nvidia's meaning for me the Arc B580 is going to land out on top but I'll link all three of these below so you can compare pricing and availability for Amazon around the world. Now with the graphics card decided upon let's talk about the CPU and this is an area where you need to make careful consideration when buying Arc. Now one thing that does hurt Intel Arc's value proposition is a CPU you overhead related issue. Hardware and Box were the first ones to spot this and bring it to everyone's attention and what it means is that a chip like this, the Ryzen 5 7600 is all good but drop down to say a last gen 5600 or 5600X and you may encounter some problems. Now the 7600 has 6 cores, 12 threads, modest clock speed and comes with an included stock cooler. So if you wanted to push the budget right down and get as close to that $800 mark as possible, you could ditch the aftermarket cooler in this build and stick with the stock one instead. A cheap aftermarket cooler though is going to really really supercharge your build's experience it's going to reduce temperatures a lot going to help you hit those boost clock speeds on the cpu that's good for frame rate and it's going to be quieter and nobody wants a noisy computer the last thing i want to do is recommend you guys build a pc that's loud this is a good shout this is the vetru v5 cooler master also have their 212 range they all perform broadly the same they're nowhere near as good as a large dual fin stack or something like a 240 mil rad however they're way better than the stock cooler and that's what matters today. I'm going to touch briefly on some storage and some memory. Storage wise I've gone for the Crucial P3 Plus. This is a really nice drive. It's available in various capacities. I've budgeted for a one terabyte drive in this build but you could save money with the 500 gig instead. Memory I've gone for this really nice affordable kit of Team Group's T-Force Vulcan. It's DDR5. It's non-RGB. It's pretty basic but is available in good speeds and capacities. Again if you want to save even more money you could drop to 16 gigs of RAM but 32 gigs is what you want. It's so so much better it's going to give you so much more leeway a bit of future proofing it just makes the system a bit more upgradable in my opinion motherboard is an area where i have managed to trim some cost out this right here is the asrock a620m pro rs wi-fi whenever amd or intel release a new cpu they bring with them different chipsets and the a620 chipset is well it's the cheapest and the most basic it's not going to be any good for overclocking it's not going to be any good for a ryzen 9 and you really shouldn't buy it if you're after high speed usb 4 because guess what it has 
hasn't got any of those either. But with the average A620 board retailing for below $100, you may have to spend slightly more if you want the privilege of Wi-Fi, which this board has on, you really have everything you need. The one thing that set this board apart from some of the others was the four RAM dims. Not only is that gonna be better for upgradability, but obviously we get that dual channel memory performance too for the added memory bandwidth, which is always good. One or two more parts to discuss. The power supply is the first. This is MSI's A650BN. And at the time of filming today's video, on Newegg, it's currently like 40 or $50 after the rebate, which is nuts, really. 650 watts, it isn't modular, but it's fairly quiet, performs well, and is 80 plus bronze certified. As far as the case is concerned, I've got two choices for you in this build. The first is this, which is Fantex XT View. Comes in around 79 USD with the fans. However, there's a very, very similar looking case called the Montec XR. That is gonna cost you about 10 dollars less. With these budget builds, there are some complicated routes to travel to make sure you can hit the price point. I'll leave both options linked below, but in my opinion, they're broadly similar. The XT View has marginally better build quality and a neat little RGB strip down the bottom. Now, with all that said and done, I think we should go ahead and put this system together. You've probably seen how to install a CPU before. If you haven't, simply lift up the socket, line up the triangle on the processor with the top left of the motherboard in this case. The triangle is printed on the socket itself. Then pop the cover down and the arm into place. As far as the RAM is concerned, in this build I'll be using the second and fourth RAM DIMM slots, a little something like so, before going ahead and sliding the memory into place. Nice and simple. Once that is all said and done, I'm next going to go ahead and install the M.2 drive and for this you'll need to ditch your large size screwdriver, grab yourself a smaller screwdriver as what I need to do is actually unscrew this M.2 heatsink instead. So go ahead and just take each of those screws out, remove the cover itself from the the actual motherboard before sliding the drive into place a little something like this. I'm then going to return our M.2 armor on top of the drive to help with cooling and fasten this down with one screw on the left and one screw on the right. The final thing I'm going to install onto the motherboard is the CPU cooler. You can see for an AMD config that we've got these two silver brackets with the points sort of facing inwards slightly and if I then line that up over the CPU socket that all fits into place nice and easily. Remember that you will need some thermal paste on the CPU. You get a little tube in included in the box before fastening the heatsink down. The fan is gonna go on later once the motherboard assembly is in the case, so don't worry about this too much for now. Moving through into the case, I need to go ahead and open up Fantex. <laughs> It's not actually that heavy. Uh, XD view. I do really like this case. As I say, there's a lot of cases that look like this nowadays. The only thing I will criticize about this case, and I don't know if this is a design, this is a design oversight in my opinion, is the fans. Now it comes with three included, which is good, I suppose. However, these two fans on the side here are actually in the exhaust mode. They're actually pulling air out the case, which is the same as one at the back, which is obviously wrong. Either way, I'm gonna swap those out. First of all, just flip them around so that they're acting in intake. And so we actually have some fresh air into the system. So our components don't overheat, which is always a good start. <laughs> as far as installing the motherboard goes, I should note the standoffs in the case are configured as standard for full-size ATX boards. This is a smaller M80X board, so you'll need to reconfigure the standoffs. And I'll show you where they should be now so you can see where to move these to. Once they've been moved, the integrated IO shield makes the next stage of the build pretty easy. Just slide the board into place and screw it down with the screws that come included with the case. Once the board is in, I'm then gonna do the power supply. Saving the GPU until a bit later just makes your life a bit easier. Now, as I said earlier, this is a 650 watt unit. It's about as low as I would recommend going in any build, really. Because the cables are non-modular, I can just go ahead and install it directly into the back of the case. Four screws to fasten this down, one into each corner, and then I'm gonna run the power cables with the CPU going up to the top left of the motherboard and the motherboard power going to the right-hand side. I'm also gonna finish off the front panel cables while I'm here. So that's a front panel JFP1 to the bottom right. It's in one easy block. Our HD audio to the bottom left, and then the USB 3 type A and USB USB 3 Type-C connections. And once they're done, it's time for the GPU, Intel's ARC B580. The ARC B580 is exciting to me in many ways because not only does it represent an enormous bump in performance over Intel's last-gen ARC lineup, what it does is it signals that Intel actually do care about the budget gamer. I mean, who's expecting Nvidia to bring out a $250 or $270 GPU anytime soon? I'd love to be proved wrong, but for now, this is what we have. And as you can see in our build today, it's gonna look great. Obviously the board being a little smaller may look a bit odd in the case. I think the GPU should help to balance the whole thing out nicely. In this build, I need to remove what looks to be the first and second PCI lane covers. Take the covers themselves out first. 
keeping hold of any thumb screws that are left over afterwards. Make sure the PCI slot is suitably pushed back and then slide the GPU into place. Get it lined up bit of pressure and it's going to click in no bother. Our art card, as I say, I think looks really nice in this build. The black design just works so well, but go for whatever art card is within budget and actually suits the need of the build. Now I'm going to return the fan back onto the CPU cooler and then I'm going to wrap up with a little bit of cable management before diving in to see exactly how well this build performs in all the latest titles. Taking a look at performance and as you can see, this pretty modest gaming PC performs really solidly at 1080p, exceeding the 60fps FPS average in every single game that we tested. Take something like Marvel's Rivals as a specific example and at 1080p on the ARC B580, the frame rate sat just shy of 90 FPS on average, with a specific average of 88 frames per second. Cyberpunk is a really hard to run AAA title and even on the B580 this performs well too. We do have the help of XCSS set to quality at the 1080p high preset, but with ray tracing turned on to and set to medium. Here Cyberpunk delivered a strong result with 72 FPS. FPS on average, and a really smooth playable gaming experience. In aid of fairness, the worst result that we pulled in was in Call of Duty's Black Ops 6. Here at 1080p high rasterization on the ARC B580, the average frame rate did drop to as low as 68 frames per second on average, with 1 and 0.2% lows of 39 and 27 respectively, but I still thought the game was very playable and looked great. And of course, if you wanted to push extra frame rate, you could knock the visual fidelity down from high to medium, give you a little more headroom. All in all though, this is a build that for a budget price point providing you can get hold of the B580 in and around MSRP delivers really strong performance and it's a system that for not really a lot of money is going to give you a solid gaming experience overall.